So does the new album represent a big leap forward musically for Supergrass? I think it's probably closer to an it for the money than Asha Coco. But un- only because it was the same sort of setup. We, you know, we had ourselves to produce and stuff and worked with the same engineer. I mean, the, the only sort of changes were we, we spent a lot more time writing songs because we'd run out of songs. So we had to spend a lot more time writing them. And it was just generally a bit more relaxed and less intense, but it's, it's close to what we did before, really. I mean, we're under a lot less pressure this time, basically, because, you know, the last album maybe didn't sell as well in England, but it didn't exactly bomb, you know, and we got good reviews and, um, you know, a good feedback from it. So we, we felt we could do it on our own terms after that. And we weren't having to rely on, you know, becoming a huge pop sensation or brushing our teeth regularly, basically. <laughs> Not really. It was just a bit more organised, I think. Uh, you know, that's probably what the leap was in the way we actually produced it and, and the time we allowed ourselves and stuff but um, In It For The Money was quite kind of pushed together after a tour kind of thing so um, yeah this one was a lot organised a lot more organised we had three months to write the songs first so we had a kind of a vague idea what we were up to in the studio whereas In It For The Money we only had about three or four songs completed when we went into the studio so you know, we've probably each got like three or four ideas for songs that you know we've whittled down, and then we do those, and half of them are crap and half are good. So, and then we we basically just jam and write some songs, come up with riffs over those over that period of time. Really, it's usually in situations where you're just you know being quite funny. Or, you know, I usually write on the piano or something. And I'm saying, look, what about this? And my piano style is quite plonky, so it's usually quite amusing. But um. It's not really daunting. It's, it's maybe more daunting that um, you haven't seen each other for a couple of months. And then, you know... But, no, you know, maybe if it was to total strangers, it would be daunting. But, you know, I've known Gaz since, for, you know, 10, 15 years, so... It's hard to say, really. I mean, it's, it's easier to sort of look at that when you, you know, after a few months or a couple of years when you've got time to, to kind of look back on it. But um, I don't know, really. It's sort of... It's, it's, it's different in, in other kinds of ways. I mean, this, the production's slightly different. I mean, we took a different angle that way, uh, trying to make it a bit rawer and, uh, you know, just to the point. Because In It For The Money was quite sort of layered and, and in that sense, quite a wide album. So, um, so yeah, but I don't think... We, we didn't really kind of think of any specific change of direction or change of style. I think it's more sort of structurally and the songs, you know, are, are quite kind of... A, vast in a way sometimes. I mean, that comes from just all of us writing as well, you know. I mean, it's uh, some of the songs are almost sort of schizophrenic in that way. It's kind of got all of our different parts or, or, you know, different chords from each of us and that kind of thing. When the band reconvenes, now that you all live in different places, are you a bit nervous at first? A lot of the success comes with, with if we feel we've, we've done a better record and, and if it was worthwhile spending that time doing it and, and if it was enjoyable. And it was kind of all three of those things, really. It was, you know, um, so it was sort of a success for us, you know, because we've done something we feel is more interesting and, and, and a, a new set of songs, basically, that we're, that we're sort of happy with. Um, so it's never really a sort of issue of, you know, I hope as many people buy it or I hope more people buy it or, or whatever. It's just, you know, I think we've got kind of, you know, we've got a solid base as well of, of fans that have been into it since the start and, you know... Um, I wouldn't have thought they'd be disappointed in any way. I don't know, it's like not seeing like a childhood sweetheart for six months. We're all really nervous around each other. It's really, <laughs> it's really quite sweet and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, when we started writing the songs for this, I mean, we'd booked three months to write these, these songs for this album. And for the first week, we were really nervous and, and, you know, sort of still feeling out the waters and stuff. But I mean, it just came together. It always does, you know, when, when all three of us are working together. You know, you get this horrible cheesy magic occurring. It's it's real horrible to say it, but it does actually happen. You know, and um, you know, after a while, we just sort of instantly gel. After a while, and just you know, by the end of the songwriting, we're writing a new song every day, literally. You know, just coming up with something completely out of the air. Pretty much, yeah. We just like have a laugh for the first day and tell each other stories, what's been going on. It's all very lovely and happy. Well, no, yeah, no, it's it's very natural. I think we've still got like a like a big chemistry spark between us, really. That musically, that we kind of understand where we're coming from. We usually have to quote a few kind of uh, bands or something if you're trying to do a certain song. It's, you know, it sounds a bit like the Beach Boys or something, and you kind of get into the idea of the song. So you know, 
usually everyone's fighting to get their new songs out anyway, so it's more of a scrap, a scrap who can get the best song out the quickest. So the promising first album, I Should Coco, has been done. The different second album, In It For The Money, is done. So have you now done the third, The Mature Album? From I Should Coco, when, you know, we were teenagers, and it was our first album. So, you know, it's bound to be a bit kind of haphazard and full of spunk, as it were. But, um, so when we came out of In It For The Money, you know, that was branded around all the time. This is our new mature supergrass, so we've learned to kind of, we've got our answers for that. And it's, uh, you know, it's not mature, it's just, you know, everyone grows up, you know, it's five years down the line. And we listen to different music, you know, got a bit more maybe into soul music and stuff like that, so... It's just a bit more relaxed rather than mature. There's still inane lyrics on there. I don't really think we've made our um, an album we've all been really amazingly happy with that we just play constantly. You know. But uh, hopefully that's to come. I did actually. I did that the other day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's, it's kind of good because I can sort of look at it a lot more. Kind of stand back and look at it a bit more. And I don't know. Just sort of realise that I really like a lot of the songs on there. I just I just thought. You know, I don't know. And, you know, I think it's definitely some of our best songs on that album, you know, that we've, that we've sort of ever done, so... Still hold great fondness to it and stuff. Bloody fast, though. <laughs> it's outrageous. It's, I was sat there with Mick the other day and we were listening to Strange Ones or something and went to this sort of three, three four bit. And uh, we were just going, it's too fast. It's not right, it's just too fast. You know, we're tired, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? We spent three years going completely mental. No, but... No, it's still all there, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing, I think, with us, is that, you know, this album isn't, isn't uh, you know, it's not the best we can do, and we, we, we want to do more, and we're kind of waiting to do more, and, and there's a lot of influences that, that, that are just always hanging around, so there's nothing saying that the next one won't be a, a, a punk rock, you know, album or, or whatever, or some sort of bizarre Frank Sinatra kind of type album, you know, you never know, really, it's just... It's like a piece of cheese. Terrible. Um, I don't know. I guess he can't avoid it, really. He, nobody's getting any younger. Um, you just have to get better, I guess, and, and whether that's maturity or um, you just get a wider idea about what you're doing. But you're also getting older and a bit slower and, you know, you're starting to dribble and wear slippers and stuff as well, so in, in a way it's not good either, you know. I mean, caught by the first, I think we're, we're probably, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got to be older and slower and stuff, but I think, I, I hope we could write a song like Caught by the Fuzz again. Um, just because it's a really good song, I think it's well put together, and it's you know it's a, a basically a good storytelling song. It's got a good lyrical content and stuff. But um, I don't know if we got busted for smoking blow now. I, I think we'd probably get banged up as opposed to a slap on a wrist and a you know a written warning or whatever. So it's difficult, really. So are Supergrass to be regarded as the traditionalists in contemporary pop music? Tapes or get really anal about getting, you know, the proper valve amps and stuff. I mean, it was just stuff that sounded good, but I suppose we're a pretty purist guitar band in a way. You know, a lot of it's from Stooges or massive American influence and, you know, listening to Neil Young for guitar sounds and stuff. And, you know, there's, there's a whole world out there. I think it was just the sounds. I think in the 80s, it was more to do with production values and, and the fact that people made very sort of uh, flat, linear albums. They didn't have any depth or warmth or humanity about them they were just you know very very flat and icy and i think that's that's why you know we get more of an affinity for listening to 70s or 60s records there seems to be more of an atmosphere more humanity about them somehow i mean the hints of it in the 80s you, know, you look at the smiths and they're always banging on about you know the new york dolls or you know the, all the lineage is there if you look for it in the, in the 80s you know the, the stuff like the cure doing their own thing or whatever but i think it was just less less in your face really you had to go looking for it Probably a bit more than we should be sometimes. Well, I mean, I can maybe I can only speak for myself, but uh, yeah, probably a little bit. Yeah, I mean, but I think it's, it's it's just I just sometimes think about whether it's you know what, what how much they, how much you can aspire, kids can you know aspire to. There's no uh, interaction with instruments or or, or you know um, realism about it or, or sweating over it and stuff. And so in that sense, I'm probably a, a traditionalist. Yeah, I'd like to see people you know picking up instruments and doing things and working for it and but yeah it's just my opinion isn't it it's fair I mean it's diff- it's a difficult one because I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily think it would be healthy for there to be a, a stream of guitar bands you know it's just 
in in that sense, you know, there is a kind of place for everything. It's just it's more like you know when I saw my brother growing up and and listening to the you know the chart stuff like we all do when we're young, you know, when I heard him sort of put on Revolver when he was about twelve, I just sort of I don't know. It kind of pleased me a little bit more than if he'd have put on you know Too Shy or something. You know, I, I don't know. It's uh, it's just a weird one for me. It's, it's more sort of personal. It's, you can't sort of tell people what to buy, and you can't sort of dictate it like that. But it's more of a personal thing for me. You've gone back to Sawmill Studio. Why? Well, it's where we started recording. It's our first kind of big studio we went into, so there's, there's a bond there from the start anyway. But um, it's just it's very quiet and remote, and it's quite exciting. You have to get there by a boat and wait for the tide to come in. There's loads of stuff to do, like crab fishing and walking around in mud and in your wellies and stuff like that. So, uh, But then again, it's very remote, and sometimes you get cabin fever and pine for Soho lights and stuff like that. So, But um, I think it's just basically the sound of the, of the studio is quite easy to get your head around. It's got a little control room, and we're quite used to the sound there. And uh, John Cornfield, who works there, who we've done our albums with, he's very familiar. You know, He helped build the desk there and stuff like that. Well, we did a lot of this album at Ridge Farm in Surrey at the start, so uh, it's good. Yeah, it's good to kind of get away from from that one studio. But I think we tend to go back there to kind of finish the record off and to mix it and stuff like that. It's got a, a very relaxed atmosphere to it. It's also, like the fact that it's not very big and it's not very grand or anything. You know, it's not a, a fully fledged, you know, twenty bedroom studio and you know being weighted on hand and foot. You got to get up and make your own breakfast and stuff. Um, but it, I don't know, it's just very comfortable there. I mean, we know the... I know how the, the sound works in the control room. I mean, when we went to Ridge Farm, I had a lot of trouble with the bottom end and I just couldn't hear it properly. I just couldn't hear what I was doing a lot of the time, although there were some other good aspects to it. But Sawmills is just, I don't know, it's like listening in your bedroom. You get a real idea of what's going on and, and you know where to go, basically. Familiarity, I think, a lot of it. You know, we, we started off there with Asha Coco. Um, Always got pretty good sound. It's always been pretty crisp and uh, and a good sort of bottom end in the in the control room and stuff. Uh, and it's just very remote and it's easy to to just get carried away in the album and stuff, which I suppose is a good thing. I mean, you know, there's a pub down the railway line, but that's a sort of 15 minute walk. So if you're really gagging for a pint, you know, get down there. But occasionally you get a little bit of a cabin fever, but you know, that's just you have to go away for a week and then come back. Do you feel that you You've grown up in a pop group. It's not like the Jacksons or the Monkeys or something where you sort of live in like right in each other's pockets. You know, we've I've grown up with my girlfriend as well and uh, uh, with my family and stuff. So, um, and it's you know it's, it's the thing about you know I've, I've you know asked about growing up in the public eye and stuff and it's that's never been really you know an issue because we you know we're not sort of ultra famous or anything. We're just kind of a band that's. This you know, school band that's done really well, or whatever I don't know how you want to put it, but so it's it's, it's not really that odd, you know. It's and um, we've kind of just sort of always got on really well, and you know, when we moved away from each other, it was it was fine, and that didn't create any problems. It was almost quite a good thing to do, you know, because we saw each other so much with working, getting a lot busier. The more you do, um, that that wasn't really a problem. I mean, who knows? We could have been tearing each other's hair out if we lived in the same place for up until now. You never know, but. Uh, and you, you just have to do things in life anyway. You like move away from your hometown and stuff. It's it's just stuff that you have to do, or well, you know, if you want to. Yeah. Well, I've never had a job, <laughs> but yeah, I grew up. My first band I was in when I was about ten. It's called the Fallopian Tubes, and uh, that's where it all started really. And uh, that's why I kept doing music really because it's interesting. So um, I've kind of grown up, you know, with my own life and stuff. And it's not like. Uh, been in the spotlight too much but I don't really know it any other way so I don't know what it's like to grow up and not be in a band <laughs> no definitely not I was definitely had a lot more happen to me before I got into this band but it's it's probably the most momentous thing that's happened to me apart from my children I mean it's it's you know it's a bit of a shocker because it not only does it affect you it affects everybody you know and you know I've got sort of grannies in Australia and, and they're reading the press about me and, and finding out you know if some horrible interviewers ask me about my sex life, my granny now knows. So, it's, you know, it's got that sort of effect on you. I mean, it surprises me how inaccurate it gets sometimes, um, and how two-dimensional. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do about that. Really, you just got to um, follow your own head. Really, 
if, you, if you aren't being honest to yourself and you're, and you're taking all this stuff on board and you actually believe it, then you know you aren't you aren't doing your do- justice to yourself or the rest of the band. Really, I mean, we just sort of had to carry on, do our own thing. Recording is one thing, but Supergrass is very much a live band. Are you looking forward to getting back on the road again? Well, it's different to promo entirely. Um, I mean, that's what I'm waiting for. I really enjoyed the last touring we did. I mean, it started off really badly um, and we couldn't play any of the songs on it for the money live very well. But by the end of the touring cycle, we were just playing the, the songs off both albums better than we'd ever played them and they were better than they were recorded. And we managed to get this enormous amount of energy and, and it sort of really gelled really amazingly live. Um, so I was quite sad to finish touring. And it, uh, hopefully we can get that back pretty quickly on this touring and, and experiment even further with what we're doing live. You know, when we wrote these songs, we did play them live in a, in a practice studio and there were versions that we could play live. And, it, and there's no point in trying to recreate your record anyway. You know, you might as well stick your CD player on the stage and, and dance around next to it. So, I mean, the whole live experience is about saying something different from the band or, you know, experiencing a different power from the band. So, you know, initially we'll probably try and recreate the album, but, I mean, eventually you find a way of doing doing something live that is different and more valid, really. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should be, you know. This would be good to try out these songs and, you know, get back out there. It's basically what we do, so, you know, gigging is always good fun. Um, yeah, so, yeah, we're definitely up for it. European gigs and stuff are always good fun. Well, they, they started off live in the rehearsal room, really, so that was, you know, so that's something different from Minute for the Money, because we, we obviously, you know, we kind of wrote quite a few of the songs in the studio for Minute for the Money. And, uh, you know, the only times we played them was when we were doing the takes, you know, so it was, that was quite weird. Uh, but this time it seems to, you know, we've played five so far, probably in you know, a couple of gigs, and they all seem to be sort of coming together nicely, so a lot quicker than the last lot of the album came together live, so, yeah, I think that's going to be cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean, all the kind of songs, no matter which album they're from, they kind of just all bun together, and, and it becomes this, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it's a sort of punk, you know, punk rock gig, really, I mean, it's a sort of three-piece, you know, with my, well, brother on keyboards, obviously, but essentially it's a three-piece, and... And uh, it's very energetic, you know, it's, it's our way of, I mean, we love playing live, it's, it's a huge release, it's like a, it's just, you know, in an hour and a half you just sort of release so much and it's just totally different to the studio, a totally different vibe. Do you think that the current state of British pop music means that we really need the CD to succeed? Will it be allowed to fail? Any band, I mean, I mean, it does, it does feel pretty confused and diverse out there i mean it's it's not like you've got this big brit pop umbrella and everyone can hide behind that you know it's, it is pretty odd times but I, I you know i don't feel we should be sort of uh spearheading anything or um i think just being ourselves and, and trying to put ourselves across as an alternative to you know mainstream dance music or whatever horrible chart music's going on you know as, as long as we're, we're sort of being honest i think that's that's something to stand up for in itself really and whether we deliver or not, it's up to people who, who listen to it, you know. I can't think about that sort of thing. I mean, you know, that's, that's um, I don't know, it's just, I, I think we're quite sort of positive, you know, there's no reason for us not to be positive. I mean, obviously, we, we, we're aware that that sort of thing happens a lot, and it may well happen, you know, you never know. But like I said, originally, it's sort of, we're, we're kind of happy with it, and we feel like we've done a better record, so uh, sort it. Well, you just forget about it after a while, you know. It's it's good at the time. We're like, wow, well, you know, we got a great review in Q, you know, or something like that. And it's, you know, that's that's good at the time. But when you come to make a new album, you're not thinking, my God, we had great reviews for our last album. It's like we've got these songs, want to make them sound good. So that's all that's you know really in your head. But it's nice, yeah. <laughs>